just had a strange dream the other night, and I can't quite make heads or tails of it. Quick background that pertains to the dream. My dad passed when I was 13 years old, and when I was really struggling with the loss back then, he appeared to me in a dream, keeping this looming darkness at bay and telling me that I would be all right. I later told somebody about that dream, and they told me that sometimes, when a loved one dies, they can come to you in dreams. I didn't believe or disbelieve, really, but it felt like a bit of comfort at the time. Now, throughout the years, I have had a dream here or there about my dad, and I always found a little comfort in thinking, hmm, maybe it's him. Fast forward about 16 years to my dream last night. So in the dream, I was in this boggy, swampy-looking area. It was dark, but still lit enough that I could see a road. I was on the road and I knew my destination was the grave of an ancestor, maybe like a great-grandfather. And all of a sudden, my dad shows up in a suburban. I hop in and we're talking when he almost drives it into a soft shoulder or ditch, which my dad wouldn't do while driving because he drove professionally in his life. We continued down the road and we got to this graveyard where I start asking him questions that he can't answer or is answering wrong. Stuff that he would know. I just got this bad feeling. I just looked at him and said, you're not my dad. He didn't get upset, but he insisted that he was and almost seemed amused. I kept looking for a grave and insisting that he wasn't my father. All the while, he kept laughing and saying, of course I am. This horse appears and starts bucking and rearing and really causing a stir until finally my dad went away. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a woman in a place that was just nothing. Like a place that was just void of everything but her and me. She said something like, when you let your dad in as a kid, you broke open a grate. And in my dream, I had envisioned like a giant sewer grate. She said it allowed all manner of spirits to come and visit as they pleased, and to masquerade as my dad. She didn't seem at all concerned or like it was a bad thing, just like she was telling me something that was a fact. At that point, I woke up. The details are obviously a little fuzzy, but I can't stop thinking about it this morning. I just figured I'd see what anyone else had to say. Maybe it was just a weird dream, but it certainly felt like something else. Yesterday evening, my fiancé and I joined two friends from high school, who I'll refer to as C and W, for an evening of board games and drinks. Given it was their first time meeting my fiancé, C and W decided to ensure that he had his fair share of drinks. Our location was W's house, where C offered to sleep on the couch, and my fiancé and I claimed the guest bedroom. After several rounds of drinks, my fiancé started feeling ill, prompting us to retire to the guest room. For some reason, I was plagued by a sense of restlessness and only managed to drift off at about seven in the morning. That's when I had this dream. In my dream, I was half awake, listening to C and W's conversation in the hallway outside our room. C was bidding goodbye, and as I drifted back to sleep, I heard his car pulling away. W, checking in on us through the door, asked if we were up yet. In my semi-conscious state, I said, no, not yet, and dozed off once more. An hour or so later, an elderly woman entered the room to wake us up. Concurrently, I heard noises of W, 
who seemed to be ill and possibly crying in the bathroom across the hallway. The woman, with a thick southern accent more reminiscent of Mississippi or Alabama than our native Louisiana, suggested we start packing up due to W's condition. I can still hear her voice to this day. She had short white hair and penciled on eyebrows, characteristic of older southern ladies. Although I can't recall her exact words, she was extremely gentle and helpful as we gathered our belongings to leave. I woke up at 10 o'clock in the morning, momentarily disoriented, as the vivid dream had me fully expecting to be in my own bed, not the guest room of W's house. I shared my unsettling dream with my fiancé, and then decided to begin tidying up the remnants of the previous night's festivities. W, C, and my fiancé eventually joined me in the living room, where we talked about the night before, and I told them about this dream. Upon describing the woman in my dream, W's face turned ashen. He asked for some additional details, before saying, My step-grandmother died in this house. I initially thought he was joking, until he showed me a picture on his phone. And there she was, the lady from my dream, standing next to W's grandfather. W confirmed that she was indeed from Mississippi and had a pronounced accent. He asked me to mimic her pronunciation of his name from my dream, which made him chuckle because he said it was a perfect imitation. Disturbed by this, I quickly finished cleaning and then drove home with my fiancé. So, dear lady, I apologize for our part in your grandson's illness from excessive drinking, and thank you for your hospitality. However, I would definitely prefer it if you wouldn't give me such a fright in the future. I've had a couple of creepy doppelganger incidents. My earliest encounter occurred around three or four years ago. I had decided to stay with my aunt. Her house was big, with three baths and various rooms. I was on the second floor alone when everything happened. I was working on a video when my step-aunt appeared. I followed her into her room, excited to show her what I'd done with my phone. My younger cousin was also in her arms. Both of them were female. She wasn't in the room when I walked in. I turned to look behind the door, thinking she was playing a joke on me, but nobody was present. I dashed downstairs to find her, but she claimed she had never gone upstairs. It was a pretty scary experience, so I stayed downstairs. The following incident happened about two to three years ago. I'm upstairs in a house by myself once more. My family home wasn't substantial. My elder sister arrived bearing our little sister. I was probably too lazy to fetch something, so I called her from across the room. Before exiting the room, she walked up to the mirror and remained there, still without responding to me. I followed her out of the room as she went at a slow pace. She was nowhere to be found. I dashed downstairs once again, where my elder sister was apparently showering in another bathroom. My younger sister was downstairs too, playing with her toys. Once again, I was super creeped out and I stayed downstairs. There are numerous parallels between these two situations. I was alone upstairs in a house that belonged to a relative. The people that came upstairs were all women and one of them was holding a toddler. Both rooms had a bed with a mirror pointing straight in the direction of the bed, and it happened in the afternoon. I don't really know what all of this means, or if these parallels mean anything at all, but I am a little bit freaked out. For the first time in my life, I had a really lucid dream. At least I hope that's what it was. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, my time, 
PST. At my back door, it's a security door, so like a metal screen door, I saw something and I thought it was my wife. I asked her why she was out there, and she said that she had accidentally locked herself out. I had been out there not five minutes before, and I knew that I didn't lock the door. She was wearing her normal bedtime apparel, but her hair wasn't the right color, and her voice wasn't quite right. I asked again what she was doing, and she just says, just let me in. I get closer to the door, but I can't see her face. I say again, why are you out there? She ignores me again and says, just let me in. I moved to open the door, and I noticed that she changed to an inhumanly small frame, which was all black and had no features. I slammed the wood door and bolted to find my wife asleep in the bed where I had left her. Now, if I'm honest, I don't even believe I was dreaming, but my mind cannot comprehend that as being real. Nothing anywhere near that level of paranormal has ever happened to me before. And whether or not it was a dream, it was definitely freaky. And I'm still trying to figure it out. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1am. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to this cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods, and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old, and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege, and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw. But before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny, and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once, 
and then died. Tiej had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiege and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there. So I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything. But we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. For almost 10 years, a few other people in my family and I have had very extreme paranormal experiences. Most of it is too long to get into now. A lot of it is tied to a house that's demonically possessed, and possibly a deceased family member who was quite emotionally disturbed and dabbled way too much in the wrong parts of the occult. But last night, I had a very intense dream. In it, this feminine demonic creature thing was over my grandfather in his sleep. I went to go fight it, and it screamed at me like a banshee. I backed away for a second, right before I woke up. Like I said, this thing felt very feminine, but to describe how it looked is a little bit difficult. It looked almost as though a large, roughly human-sized sheet of leather became sentient and started floating and moving and flying. It didn't have a solid, discernible form exactly either. It literally almost looked like a flying leather monster. It was so black, roughly around where its head might have been, that it was more black than black itself, if that makes any sense. But besides that, like I said, it just sort of looked like a flying leather monster. And then, of course, there was the horrible, threatening scream. I've had other encounters in my sleep with evil paranormal entities at this point, and it's pretty much all connected to that certain house, and possibly that family member. But I'm just wondering what it was. Was it actually a banshee? There's also this wolf that has been stalking around the house for a few months now. It attacked our dog, actually. The house is in Connecticut, but it's in the north, where it's very condensed forest. So it's extremely uncommon, but not unfathomable, that a rogue wolf ended up there. I personally saw a mountain lion there once, and I've seen my fair share of black bears. But I don't know what this thing could have been. I haven't actually lived in the house in question for about four years, other family still does, though. I don't 
know what's going on, and I've never seen an entity like that thing before. I'm just trying to figure out if anybody might know what it is. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience. If my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her but the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later, and my dad backs up the claim, since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment, and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. 
Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins, then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend, but leaving him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down. Although I kept thinking, what is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. I look up, and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share.
My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift to see and experience things that were, I guess, paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened. Someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks, due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze, and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members. But nothing. Just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out, and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is, I was all alone in our cabin, playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room, on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow, until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now, since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, 
who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember, though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. Back in 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were always allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, etc. either on the table in my shoe or next to my shoes. One morning, I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under the couch. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled my phone back toward me but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone, pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out and even to this day I get chills thinking about or relating this experience. The hand was obviously thin to be able to slide in and out from underneath that couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled. And the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick and yellow. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone or why it wanted it, but it creeps me out to this day. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet, 
another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted, but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen, and then we heard the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking, and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the U.S. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot-long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, 
and closed my eyes. I was a 23-year-old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood-scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall, and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room, and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway... Once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute homey and warm. I spend time there alone and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to though. Can't argue with results. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. 
but these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brothers. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider, though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read general store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. 
They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera. And the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle. And eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life, until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings, and honestly sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost, maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes, so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I began to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched. Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. 
One night we were sitting around playing video games when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end, and the living room, TV, wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer, and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning, though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room, when BAM, the roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night, that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck? He said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, eh, it's probably in the wall seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail, and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand.
This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace. And I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name and I felt like I knew him, but I also knew that I had never met him in person and I couldn't place him. He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born, and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90-something, and the dream that I had was also on December 31st. About three years ago, my friend who I had known since birth was diagnosed with leukemia. After an intense and scary year-long battle, the cancer won. I miss him so much that I'm tearing up just writing this. Something happened before he died, though, that was really weird. I was eating some food in my dream, and my friend rang the doorbell. He had all of his hair, and he looked happy and healthy. He looked at me and said, I had a life I was going to live, and I couldn't live it. I want you to live a life and enjoy it. He smiled a bit and shrugged and said, Hey, it'll be okay without me. I'll miss you too up there. But don't worry about me. The pain is gone. He went in for a hug, and we hugged for what felt like an eternity. I love you, man, he said, as his parents' car door opened. I yelled, Mark, don't leave me. Live. You have to live. He just looked at me and said, Sorry, man. I gotta go, and kind of laughed. I screamed and screamed, don't leave me, over and over. But he got in the car, drove down the street, into a bright blue light, his favorite color. The second that the car was engulfed, I woke up crying and screaming. This all happened just as my mom got home. She walked in as I was crying and she said, Mark died. And I just kept crying and said, I know, I know. I cried for the whole day, but it did feel better being able to say goodbye in some way. I really do miss him. Rest in peace, Mark. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21 year old female in my second year of nursing and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit. 
but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful, and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset, when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second, and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter, because it was light enough to see the sky, and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double-checking the doors and windows, 
when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted, and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human, though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, step, step. Step, step, step. Around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside and I heard, all right, see you later, and more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin, asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting just to be sure we know who we're dealing with, or what. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way, though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge, with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. 
After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack, and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually, I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was, and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed, and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit, of a formerly enslaved person, who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day. So there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. I feel like I should start this story with a content warning for side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed side. I don't remember how, 
I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life. I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today. My mom receives a call from the friend and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong. And it is. The woman had hung herself about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man. So I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time, I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me. Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different, almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. 
In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room, so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead, I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything 
told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was, unfortunately, all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away, and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up, since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill. Drink some coffee, hang out, and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like Boxer from Animal Farm. 
I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day, and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. This was in the summer of 2018, and it's still one of the most terrifying things I have ever experienced. At the time of this story, I was 12 years old. My sister, Jessica, called me and asked if I was up to babysit for two kids for some money for the weekend. This would be while she and her son and daughter and her best friend went to New Mexico. I agreed, because I wanted some money, and the kids were nice and I didn't see anything wrong with it. I lived five minutes away from my sister, so I asked her if I could go ahead and get some stuff before I came over there, and she said that was fine. I got some things to stay the night, and I started to get a nervous feeling in my stomach, but I chalked it up to just being nervous to babysit. My mom didn't want me staying alone in the house, so my older brother Axel stayed the night with me. It was about 7 p.m., and I fed the kids dinner and bathed them, and they were ready to go to bed. I was still feeling pretty nervous, but I just shook it off. I decided I was going to sleep in my sister's room, because I liked her bed and she had a giant TV. The way her house is set up, there's her room, and in her room, the back door is there. Outside of her room, directly, is the kitchen. At around 11 p.m., I heard the gate softly open, and my heart sank. I called my brother, freaking out. He ran into the room and opened the back door to see the gates were open. 
He called to me. Uh, we probably just forgot to close them, or the wind blew them open. It'll be okay, Willow. He closed the gates and then the door, making sure to lock it. I'm gonna head to bed. If you need me, come to the living room. I smiled and continued watching TV. I kept hearing tapping and knocking sounds all night, and I was really freaked out. I kept texting my mom, and she told me to just try to relax and watch some Netflix. I did that for a couple of hours, and at about 3 a.m., I realized I was really hungry. I decided to go into the kitchen and get some food. As I entered, I felt my stomach drop as I heard the back door open. It felt as though ice water was injected into my veins. To this day, I have never felt the terror that I felt right then. I heard footsteps behind me, and I felt heavy breathing on my neck. I glanced down the counter, and I saw a knife. I quickly grabbed it and turned around. I saw nobody there, but the back door was wide open. Tears welled up in my eyes as I ran into the living room. I woke up my brother, sobbing, and he called my mom while holding me. The rest of the night, we heard loud stomping and loud taps, and to this day, I am still terrified of her house. So, I should start this by saying, I'm a healthy, sane, 18-year-old male. I've never had hallucinations or been seriously sick in my life. I've also never been known to black out or take micro naps. My mother has schizophrenia, but as far as I know, it was pretty mild, and I've never had any symptoms of it. With all of that out of the way, here's what happened. I was hanging out with my significant other before they went to class at college and before I had to go to work. We parted ways and I got on the bus to go home and get ready. I got on the bus with five other people and I sat in the back, as I usually do, so all five were in front of me. I looked down to check my phone when the bus started to move so I could check the route, because I'm a nervous person and I wanted to make sure that I was on the right route. I was. I looked up after maybe 30 seconds, and I'm absolutely positive that the bus had not stopped to let anyone off. Somehow though, all five of the people that I had gotten on with were just gone. The only people on the bus were me and the driver. It freaked me out a good bit because the next bus stop was still up ahead, so there's no way the bus had stopped and let people out in the middle of the road. I checked my phone again to get my mind off of it, and then suddenly the bus turned onto a different street, which is weird since the route had no turns. It was a straight line. I'm very much into horror, so my immediate thought was, great, I guess I'm going to hell. I signaled that I wanted to get off, though, and the driver let me off without saying anything. I've been thinking about this all day, and I still have no idea what could have happened there. I know it's not as creepy as some stories, but it genuinely freaked me out. When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, 
I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall, but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, Who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside, calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation, went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason, to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then, we realized we could see straight through the guy, to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear, as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here, or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at Cabin C-82 is something we reminisce about often, but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia, and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in Cabin C-82. I've seen my own doppelganger three times in my life. The first time, I was 21, with my dad and mom, and we were going to Buena Park, California to visit Knott's Berry Farm. We lived near Seattle at the time. We were all preparing to go down to the small pool at the end of the motel. I was watching some TV and I was in no hurry. Finally, my mom came rushing back in saying, You've got to come see this. There's a guy down by the pool who looks exactly like you. Then my dad walks in saying, I said to that guy, how'd you get here so fast? Because I thought it was you. 
You two could be exact twins. They begged me to come down and look at the guy, but I didn't care to see myself in swimming trunks, so I declined. The second time, I was 28 and I was in Newport Beach, California. I was at a church dance where they have a large cultural hall that has no mirrors and the walls are not reflective. I'm dressed badly. I'm dressed in a brown and white lumberjack shirt with the sleeves rolled halfway up, blue jeans, and a white belt that I once borrowed from my aunt. So, I go in and I find a couple there and I chat with them and try to joke with them for a minute. Then I see the snack bar, so of course I head over to it. I'm munching on some cookies and drinking some punch, and I look over to where the couple is still standing. There's a guy there trying to joke with them. He looks exactly like me. He's wearing a brown and white lumberjack shirt with the sleeves rolled halfway up, blue jeans, and a thin white girly belt. It was me just two or three minutes before. It was like I was watching the past of my own life. I dropped my half-eaten cookie and my half-drank cup of punch and I ran out of that hall, across the foyer, and out of the church. I ran for a whole block and a half. I finally stopped, out of breath, and I said to myself, Wait a minute, I want to see this. So I returned to the church, looked around, and my twin was gone. I'm at the Bay Dance Club in Salt Lake City. I'm 36 by this time, and I used to sit in this one chair near the entrance to the dance floor. It gave me a good view of everything, and it was just sort of my chair. I mean, not really, but I kind of became a fixture there, and everybody just knew that that's where I always sat. One night, I decided to sit someplace else, on the other side of the dance floor. I tried it out, but I'm a creature of habit, and so, eventually, I decided that I couldn't really see a lot from over here, and I just didn't like it. So I got up and I started to make my way back across the dance floor to the chair I always sat in. I see a guy sitting in that chair. And as I get closer, I realize that the guy was me. But he looked straight through me. He was sitting there doing what I always did. Checking out girls and looking around. I kind of felt a panic attack coming on. So I just kept walking until I was outside back to my car and I drove off. Up until now, I've never seen my doppelganger again, but who knows when it might be next. I'm a skeptic but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible. It's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods, miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars, which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set, and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small, bluish orbs, and honestly, the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, 
except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought, there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me, other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this, though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit, because I would have no way of proving that. Electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that, but that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of societal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. 
Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone, and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full-time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five-day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, Oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just a darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York, and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house, so I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. 
We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill, but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream 
while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, Babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. So I reached forward to pet him and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13 and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields, basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield One, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost but he's an experienced hunter 
and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? Something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. I'm wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House it was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together and we both saw it. And then we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there though. We were the only ones there and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. 
All of the things that happened to me were between three in the morning and six in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there?